Good morning and welcome to the subcommittee. We're going to start a minute or two early because uh, Senator Mikulski has to get down to the floor on an important issue that's pending uh, before us and uh, will be called for a vote at 11 o'clock. So we want to have her participation and as much time as possible. Before we begin this hearing uh, this morning, I'm going to ask all who are gathered here today to join me in standing for a moment of silence for those who died at last week's tragic shooting at Fort Hood, including Sergeant First Class Daniel M. Ferguson, Staff Sergeant Carlos Lazani Rodriguez, and Illinois Native Sergeant Tim Owens. Would you all please rise? Very nice. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome our witnesses, Lieutenant General Patricia Horaho. Yes, sir. You did well. Surgeon General of the Army, yes. Vice Admiral Matthew Nathan, Surgeon General of the Navy, Lieutenant General Thomas Travis, Surgeon General of the Air Force, and Mr. Christopher Miller, Program Executive Officer for Defense Healthcare Management Systems. Our hearing today uh, focuses on the well-being of our service members, and it's paramount on our minds. One of the responses to the tragic shooting at Fort Hood on April 2nd has been to ask questions about how we support our troops as they deal with stressors from long overseas deployment, personal relationships, financial stress, and so many other things. I'm not going to speculate about what happened uh, that caused this tragedy at Fort Hood. The investigation will have to answer those questions. But in an interview with the Washington Post this weekend, General Peter Corelli, former Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, stated that efforts to hire more mental health clinicians, is ham those efforts are hamstrung by the same shortages that affect the entire country. This is an alarming statement from a retired general who's put so much work into how the armed forces deal with post-traumatic stress. This subcommittee is keenly interested in the witness assessment of the Defense Department Network of Care for Service Members and Families, and we may never know the cause, the real cause of this tragedy at Fort Hood. But last week's tragedy shows us that even at one of the best military bases in the world, with a reputation for mental health excellence, there are problems that still exist. This subcommittee is committed to identifying strategies to confront those problems. While caring for the psychological health of our service members remains a serious challenge, Achievements in medical research for battlefield medicine have been enormous. Improved tourniquets and compounds like quick clot, treat hemorrhages, and given our, have given our service members extra minutes and hours that literally make the difference between life and death. <clears throat> Thanks to these research efforts, military personnel in Iraq and, Af and Afghanistan survived and are surviving at a rate two to three times that of the Vietnam War. It is nothing short of a miraculous revolution. These advances don't stop at the battlefield or at level one trauma hospitals. Amazing research affecting the quality of life of this new generation of wounded warriors has been emerging. There's a picture I'm going to show you here of Army Specialist Luis Puertas, who I met last month when he was in Washington. September 2006, he was on patrol in Baghdad. A bomb ripped his Humvee. He lost both of his legs instantly. The department's advances in medical research saved his life and gave him an opportunity to inspire a nation. When he arrived at Walter Reed, he said he just wanted to learn how to walk again. Then he said a strange thing happened. He decided instead he wanted to run. He played soccer in high school in Florida. He'd never run competitively, so he started training. 360 days after his amputation, he had his first Army 10K. Last May, he completed, uh, competed in the fourth annual Wounded Warrior Games in Colorado Springs finishing first in the 100 meters, first in the 200 meters, and first in the 1500 meter races. He represented the United States at the 2013 International Paralympic Committee Athletics World Championship in Lyon, France last July, and he wants to represent the U.S. in Rio in 2016. Lives saved and lives improved. This is what medical research is all about. Researchers at Johns Hopkins University, and I know the pride that Senator Mikulski takes in that great institution, yes performed the first ever double hand transplant procedure 
on a combat wounded quadruple amputee in December 2012. Last year, and I'm equally proud of the Rehab Institute of Chicago, have joined in research contributing to the world's first thought-controlled bionic leg. Astounding. It's a result of American researchers across the country rising to the challenge and pushing the boundaries. None of it would have been possible without the investments made by the Department of Defense and Congress and the American people, working to ensure that we maintain our lead role in research and innovation. Today's budget, uh, of course, faces a constrained environment, but we also have to continue to think of new ways to provide health care and research. Captain James Lovell Federal Health Care Center in North Chicago is a first-of-its-kind partnership between the active military, in this case the Department of the Navy, and the Department of Veterans Affairs. This was a rough marriage <laughs> to bring together in a matter of just blocks that Great Lakes Hospital and the North Chicago VA Hospital that was destined to be closed. It's open, and they merged together. The battles we fought between different cultures, active military versus VA, different unions, different computer systems. I want to know if we've learned anything from it, and I'll ask that during the course of the hearing. In a similar vein, the Integrated Electronic Health Record Program is long overdue and long over budget. It's time for some hard questions to be asked about whether progress is being made. Finally, and most recently, the fiscal year 2015 budget proposes consolidating TRICARE as well as additional fees and pharmacy co-pays in order to rein in escalating and unsustainable health care costs. Can't think of a more controversial issue that could come before any committee that relates to our military than to talk about benefits starting with TRICARE. So we're going to ask a few questions today about it. I look forward to your testimony. Since Senator Cochran's not here at the moment, I'll send, turn it over to the chairman of the full committee, Senator Barbara Mikulski. General Horaho, let me ask you this first. I am concerned as to whether or not we have adequate behavioral medicine resources for our active military. And I note that we have increased the number of behavioral health providers, uh, most of them civilians, 43% between 2009 and 2013. However, the numbers that you gave us about the increased visits mm -hmm. show an increase beyond 43%. First question, are we bringing in enough behavioral health providers to meet the need? Secondly, a specific. The Army's goal has been to recruit 10 psychiatrists annually. Over the last five years, they've only been able to recruit a total of six psychiatrists. What's the problem? Is there something we should be thinking about in order to entice the very best psychiatric professionals to help our men and women in uniform? I don't want to speculate about what happened at Fort Hood, but I do want to look, as you have, at the big picture and realize that we are facing challenges the military has I don't think, ever faced in our history as a nation. I mean, I can recall that scene in Patton where he leaned over the bed and slapped the soldier and said, I don't care if your nerves are shot, get back with your unit. And how we've come so far now to understand post-traumatic stress and what it can do physically and mentally to a person. So tell me, are we recruiting and enlisting adequate behavioral health providers? And why are we falling short year by year when it comes to recruiting psychiatrists? Thank you, Senator. Um, when you brought up the story about Patton, my dad fought World War II, Korean Vietnam, is 89 years old and still living today. And so I'm re reminded daily what we didn't do in the past and how different what we're doing today. But we're also in a, an era where I think we don't know the impact of what 12 years of war has on an individual and on their family. And so there has been an aggressive movement to actually increase behavioral health capabilities and not just psychiatrists, but really breaking down the barriers between psychiatrists, psychologists, psych nurse practitioners, as well as our behavioral health technicians. And so we have looked at um, what is the behavioral health capabilities that we need and have increased um, that those teams. We've had a 150% increase in the number of behavioral health team members. So we're up to about uh, 5,500 right now. 
Will we ever have enough? I don't think we will, because I think what we've seen is as we've increased the number of behavioral health providers and we decrease the stigma by embedding behavioral health where our, our soldiers are actually working so it breaks down that barrier, we're seeing an increase in demand. To do two million visits a year has really shown us that I think the stigma is starting to decrease. 